It's Saturday night. That means it's time for the Don Tony Show. The wait all week long is finally over. Get Don Tony's perspective on current affairs in the world of pro wrestling and much more. The Don Tony Show. And now your host, the man, the legend, Don Tony. Hey, how you doing, everybody? Wooden spoon survivor right here. Ma, I love you. But that wooden spoon, no wooden spoons in this house. How's everybody doing? Welcome to this edition of the Don Tony Show. I am Don Tony. I hope everybody is having a wonderful weekend. Much love, as always. Little bragging rights, everyone. Yesterday was July 8th. Oh, you think? Today's July 9th. Yesterday was July 8th. One month ago, exactly one month ago on June 8th, the Don Tony Show debuted on Pro Wrestling TV. One month later, I am happy to announce, we're still there, the number one video on demand show period bigger than triple a lucha libre bigger than control your narrative bigger than the iconics podcast every show on their network the don tony show is number fucking one so for all those haters out there oh dt your youtube numbers suck I'm in a good mood, but I am also in a shitty mood. If you allow me for a minute, pay a little respects. Somebody passed away um, yesterday, the age of 79. You know, I guess gangster movies, it happens in threes also. We had Ray Liotta. We had James Caan. Sonny! Sonny! You're not even Italian. <laughs> Yesterday, Tony Sirico passed away. You know him as Paulie Walnuts. Who could ever forget the Stacker 2 commercial with Taz? Hey, Taz, what do you got? Hey, I got this connection with Joe Numbers in Brooklyn. Stacker 2. Remember that? Anybody that's a longtime friend of yours truly, growing up Don Tony episodes... I have talked about this many times over the years. Tony Sirico is a good friend of the family. Met him so many times. On the right, he is at my parents' house having a cocktail a couple of years ago. Tony Sirico, good friend of the family. Being laid to rest in Bensonhurst the 13th. Yes, we are going to the funeral, pay our respects. Yeah, Sopranos. That's where everybody remembers him from. I never liked the Sopranos. And you know, right before, that's my dad on the left, by the way, and that's my mom on the right. Love them both. Someone asked right before we went live, hey, you got a funny Tony Sirico story? And I, yeah, I thought of one right away. Probably about 10 years ago, my father had this Christmas party. Some of you already know this story, but my father had this Christmas party. Jeff, don't jump the gun. You're on the right track, Jeff. You're on the right track. Big shout out to everybody who's live, by the way. Everybody in the archive, much love as always. About 10 years ago, my father had a Christmas party at his house. Now, one of the, the most important things in Far Rockaway, Queens, is there is a house. They call it the Little North Pole. And it is famous. The TV has covered it. You do a Google search, they have a wiki just for this person's house. Guy lives about six blocks away from my parents. So about 10 years ago, Tony Sirico hanging out, goes to the little North Pole, goes back to my parents' house for a Christmas party. And I'm over there. And we're talking. And he brings up the Sopranos. And I said, I've never... Been a fan of Sopranos. The fuck you talking about? Why does this guy not like the Sopranos? You kidding me? You know, you, you, you're bullshit. 
No, no, no. I, I never liked The Sopranos. What the fuck did you not like about The Sopranos? Nick, what the fuck's wrong with your son? And you not like The Sopranos? Oh, what do you, what do you, how, how could you not like The Sopranos? Well, you know, I just never really got into it. It just felt that it was too sensational. Sensationalized. What are you, a fucking movie critic? We had so much fun that night. I felt like shit. I felt like I had, I felt dirty. I felt like I had to cleanse myself by watching weeks of nothing but The Sopranos. But um, the guy was just a really, you know, I want to make this clear. Let me make this clear. All right. You know, my, my neighborhood over here, you got a lot of shady people. Let's not mix things up. Tony Sirico, back in the 70s, did his share of time in prison. It was movies, Hollywood, his look, his character, the way he talked. That's what stirred him, swayed him into the right path and became one of the most sincere, generous, you know, kind-hearted men uh, to come out of this neighborhood, turn his whole life around. So I just wanted to pay my little respects for a moment to Tony Sirico, a.k.a. Paulie Walnuts. Rest in peace. As I wrote on Twitter, the kids that are too cool for school, that can't acknowledge us, acknowledge us in any way. It's all good. But Tony, you don't sleep with the fishes. You sleep with the angels. Rest in peace, Tony Sirico. I wanted to also make mention, because I know nobody's going to bring up this guy anywhere. Rest in peace to Chris Shore. I know 99.99% of you out there have no idea who that is. Chris Shaw was involved with ProWrestling.net, Jason Powell. Remember back in the day, I used to call him Goofy Powell and all this stuff? Well, Chris Shaw used to hand me my ass sometimes, you know, but a genuinely good guy. Did a little work, I think, with the Carolinas, with a little bit of local wrestling. Um, worked behind the scenes. Did, I think, a little podcasting as well. But he passed away, you know, not in the greatest of health, but I heard he, he died of a heart attack. So I just want to make mention of Chris Shaw because I know 99.9% .9 of the people out there don't know who he is and probably don't care. So, all right. We have a few things to get into tonight, eh? We got to talk about Vince. We got to talk about the latest accusations of the sex capades. We also got to put it in a little bit of perspective. We got to tell it like it is. So we'll talk about Vince tonight. We'll talk a little bit about SmackDown. We'll talk a little bit about AEW Rampage, the dumbest match stipulation in recent memory. And the entire internet wrestling community trying to rub the elbows with Tony, they give him a pass. The fuck you have a stipulation like that? I mean, I'm all for some fun, lighthearted. If it's Thanksgiving, you get a little bit of gravy thrown on your face. If it's Christmas, you do Christmas presents as weapons. You know, you do. I don't mind shit like that. But I understand Mark Sterling does so much behind the scenes for AEW. I will not take that away from him. But just because this motherfucker works behind the scenes doesn't mean, hey, Tony, I want to do a little stipulation on TV. I want to sign this petition. We want to get Swerve Strickland out of AEW. So I want to do a couple of skits on TV. You know, I need all this time on TV. Give me four minutes, two segments on Dynamite. You know, two, two segments that other people could really use. And what I want to do is I want to walk around and, you know, go up to Keith Lee and others and say, hey, sign my petition so we can get Swerve Strickland out of AEW. And then in the end, I only have one signature left needed. I only need one. Motherfucker is so, so stupid in storyline. He can't just forge someone's name. I only need one more signature. Orange Cassidy. You sign. Oh, I can't sign. I need to consult with my lawyer. Who the fuck you think his lawyer is? Eugene. I, I need fucking lawyer. And I propose this. On Rampage, Tony Nice. Your client, he'll face my client, Orange Cassidy. And if Orange Cassidy loses, 
He'll sign your petition. And Swerve is gone from AEW. You remember that press release for the tournament, for the interim championship? Something that could have been said in three sentences and it was like five paragraphs. Remember we said Tony Khan was probably stoned with someone having the munchies? Dude, what if we do this? And we have like a couple of New Japan guy and dude, whatever. This is what this sounds like. Oh, dude, let's do this. And that was an actual fucking match and stipulation on Rampage yesterday. And I'm listening to Jim Ross who they're now trying to elevate Rampage a little bit, trying to get that popular voice on Rampage, and they're trying to fucking take seriously this awful, I mean, who the fuck in AEW, and I don't even think WWE would do something like, dude, I got this brilliant idea. Like, just to get a little attention on Swerve and Tony Nese, I'll do this, hey, I'll do this con this petition thing, and and uh, we'll have Orange Cassidy not you know was gonna sign it. He's got uh, oh, I mean, Sarah, the fuck come up with this? Awful, awful. Don't make any mistake about it. I like Dan Housen. Dan Housen is a breath of fresh air. It's almost like Santino Manella you know, version AEW. Just someone who is lighthearted, puts smiles on people's faces, is not going to knock it out in the wrestling ring. You know, feel good, character, connects with the fans, puts smiles, that's it. But the main event, the fucking rant, no wonder why your ratings are like this. You shove either Ring of Honor down our throats or you shove this fucking garbage. Garbage. Just saying, just saying, hey, the main event of Rampage. We got to mention it. Anyway, we also got to talk about Bizarro Land once again uh, with Chris Benoit. Fucking 15-year anniversary just came in what? We couldn't have this conversation two weeks ago when it was the 15-year anniversary. Bizarro Land has returned. And the funny thing is, is that people think I'm talking about Jordan Grace. I, uh, I do not intend on talking about what Jordan Grace said tonight. It has nothing to do with Jordan Grace, what we're going to talk about tonight. But, uh, yeah, no, we're, we're going to talk about the sympathy for the devil. And if people didn't figure it out, props to everyone who did, who sent me emails and DMs, yes, that logo is from the Rolling Stones album, and that's why I use that for this. Sympathy for the fucking devil. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But first, before we get into Vince, before we get into Chris and Bizarro Land, you know, we got to talk about a few things. You know what? Since we brought up Rampage, let's just throw it out there. Serena Deeb and Mercedes Martinez beating two enhancement talent again because they want Serena Deeb and Mercedes Martinez fight each other and they can't figure out a good way to do it. Oh, there's a little bit of friendly competition between the two, a little bit of a falling out. So now you got to get Serena Deeb versus Mercedes Martinez. Good match, but uh, you could have built this over fucking dark and elevation for the last month. Lee Moriarty and Jonathan Gresham. We already know that Jonathan Gresham and Lee Moriarty were going to face each other you know, uh, with this Ring of Honor stuff. But now we're, they're a tag team against the Gates of Agony, and Jonathan Gresham turns yesterday, and they're making a big thing about it, and I have nothing against Jonathan Gresham, but for most wrestling fans out there, they're like, um, why do I care about this? Why? With all due respect, please, for the Lee Moriarty fan club that's tuning in, tell me why do I care that Jonathan Gresham turned against Lee Moriarty? Turn against someone that I give a shit about on TV, but designed to face each other. Eddie Kingston versus, and I'm using my way of saying it, Konosuke Takashita. Fuck you, Excalibur, and I'm a big fan of Excalibur, but Konosuke Kukitika, nobody pronounces it like that. Just like nobody says Ray Phoenix. No, it's Ray Phoenix, Konosuke Takashita. But the reason why they have to use the different name is because you look at the last name, and if you put a play on words, it looks like, I'm going to take a shit He has a match with Eddie Kingston yesterday. Fun match. Kingston gets the win. Orange Cassidy defeats Tony Nese. 
So he does not sign the petition. And that was your rampage. 442,000 viewers. That's my prediction. Smackdown yesterday. Not a whole much to come out of it. Just felt like, hey, let's buy a week. Let's buy a week. I mean, look, opening up with Roman Reigns, the Usos, and Paul Heyman is always good. And Paul Heyman on fire yesterday on the mic, cutting a promo, uh, saying to who was 24 years old and was not supposed to beat The Rock for the title, who went up an undefeated 21-0 Undertaker, was not supposed to conquer the streak, who, in a do-or-die situation, that is Brock Lesnar. Paul Heyman is scared because Roman will have to be the best Roman Reigns ever to take care of Brock Lesnar in a no-holds-barred, you know, falls count anywhere. You know, only one person can answer the 10 count. You know, and... Basically, he's just selling this match. Now, yes, we have seen them fight each other. Last man standing match. All right. They got to make us feel like there is possibility that Brock Lesnar could win. My feelings right now is Brock Lesnar has no shot of winning this championship because they have not done a storyline yet where the title is going to be defended twice in one night. They got to start a storyline soon where somebody from Raw wants a challenge, somebody from SmackDown wants a challenge, and then Adam Pierce comes out and says, I have an idea. At blah, 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 blah. Maybe Survivor Series. Blah, 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 blah. We'll take on blah, 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 blah. But that's not all. Blah, 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 blah. Roman, we'll take on blah, 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 blah. And then Roman's got to defend the belt twice in one night. Then you could split the titles. Have You could have one person win. You could have both individuals win. Roman lose it all. That could be what they do. I wouldn't do a triple threat match because if Roman loses the first pin, um, it's kind of stupid because then it becomes a one-on-one -on -one match. So that's like TNA stuff. Oh, we start as a triple threat match. Two belts on the line. There's got to be two winners. And after the first winner, it's now a one-on-one -on -one match for the other title. That's TNA stuff. Theory, teasing that he's going to cash in the briefcase. Not happening anytime soon. Theory, getting under people's skins. I liked yesterday how they didn't keep him out there long enough where Roman Reigns could actually take some pot shots at him. You know, theory is more of like that annoying mosquito. Remember that little fruit fly I told you that flies around your computer screen at 2 o'clock in the morning? And you know it's there, but it's not even bothering you. But you got to, like, turn your whole house's lights on. And you got to, like, literally take out a blowtorch. I got to kill this little fucking fruit fly. It's not bothering you. You don't even have fruit in the house. But it's that annoying fruit fly that you know is there and you got to do something about it. That's what Theory's job is for the foreseeable future. You know. Next, we had stupidity. We were talking about this yesterday in the watch party. You had Shanky and Jinder Mahal get their asses handed to them from the Viking Raiders. Next thing you know, the New Day's music hits. The New Day come out. With these tickets, oh, we got tickets for an ass beating. Oh, because everybody on social media now, unless you say fuck Vince McMahon or fuck this person or the hell with this person, nobody could get a laugh anymore. I kind of like tweaked the picture yesterday. I think this looks a little bit better. I posted it. Nobody gave a fuck. I deleted it. I don't care. I deleted it. Little ass eating. Little ass eating couldn't hurt anybody. Anyway, they come out with their tickets and they go in the ring and they get their asses handed for the Viking Raiders. And as this is happening, I'm saying to myself, where is fucking Shanky Panky? What happened to Jinder and Shanky? Did they just evaporate in, into the air? They just got their asses handed to them from the Viking Raiders. And you watch this whole thing that goes down with the new day, they're gone. 
They're gone. They went the Moxley route, and they went. They did the Jeff Hardy route. They went back into the crowd, into the boondocks. They just disappeared. Disappeared. So I thought that was pretty stupid yesterday. I was going to play the clip tonight. I just didn't have enough time to do some editing. Yesterday, we had Shinsuke Nakamura take on Ludwig Kaiser. And pretty much what this is leading to is, you know, Shinsuke gets the win, viable threat for Gunther. As we talked about already, the non-pay-per-view streak of the championship, the IC title, that streak will end at SummerSlam with Gunther. But basically, Shinsuke, if he wins, you know, viable threat for Gunther. Well, he beat uh, Ludwig yesterday. And during a watch party, I said, as soon as he lost, I said, oh, you got to take it like a man now. And everybody's like, what do you mean? And I started going, Art, ice, I, don't, ah. I sounded like a German Japanese man and called everything about Gunther taking the abuse. You know, put your hand behind your back and take the chops like a man. Three chops from Gunther. Little sympathy for Ludwig Kaiser shows how ruthless Gunther is. Punishing Ludwig for losing the match. Loved it. Loved it. Another thing I loved, Lacey Evans. How many times on this show for the last two months did we say, WWE's going to wait until after the 4th of July, Independence Day, uplifting, military, our independence. We're not a perfect country. We'll never be a perfect country. There'll never be this old Star Trek episode where everybody is giving each other a flower. You know, it's not happening. But if you control yourself and you worry about yourself and you worry about the people you come in contact with, you treat people the way you want to be treated, a lot of this shit will get rectified of what's going on. The problem is, is that people realize that it's too popular to be a dick and it's too popular to inflame and it's too popular to look at evil and call it evil instead of trying to preach love and respect and everything else. That's why, like I say, everybody mourns for Hana Kimura. And then that, that formula I told you, three weeks later, half of those people, we got to be better. We got to treat people better. They're trying to drive other people in the ground. Happens every day. You get a tragedy. Everybody uh, give the kumbaya moment. We got to all look at each other in the mirror. We got to, you know, turn the other cheek. And then literally, literally a day or two later, it's let's just bury the people we absolutely despise. Everybody that's a Trump supporter is a racist. Everybody who's a Democrat is trying to kill this and ruin this. Get the fuck out of here. Seriously. So. Wait until after the 4th of July to have Lacey Evans turn. And a lot of people didn't notice it. On the 4th of July, there were a lot of people paying tribute to Lacey Evans and others on social media. Lacey, thank you for your service. Thank you for defending our freedoms. And anybody who posted like kind of like a crappy photo of her, you know, she turned around and she's on, on July 4th, she's like, is this the best you could come up with? This is what you think of me? Seed, seed planted. Yesterday she comes out, nice response. That crowd could have given her the John Cena pop, Steve Austin pop. It wouldn't have mattered. She came out, nice pop, not enough, goes at the back. As the music hit again, better pop. She's not happy. What's wrong with all of you? Goes in the back. Now the fans are getting annoyed. Like, hey, hey, the fuck, man. You know, we're cheering for you. You know, that's good enough. You know, you ain't fucking Cena. Hits the third time, comes out there. You know, what are you all fat? You all like, you know, weighed down because of pork bellies or whatever she said. Said you could all kiss my ass. She's supposed to take on Aaliyah. I think they were supposed to take on Shayna Baszler. I don't remember who the other opponent was. And um, Ali is like, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? We're supposed to have a match. Hey, Ali, your opponents weren't even in the ring. 
So Lacey Evans basically knocks her on her ass. Lacey Evans now feels that the storyline is, you know, country doesn't appreciate what she has done. You wait until after the 4th of July, especially right after the 4th of July. And now we have Lacey Evans. She will probably be the next threat for Liv Morgan. But for now, Liv Morgan will be taking on Ronda Rousey at SummerSlam. Liv comes out on SmackDown, and this was like a repeat of Raw. Liv, thankful is for all of you. Dreamt this home my whole life. Natty comes out. You wouldn't be champion if it wasn't for me and what I did to Ronda. It was like the repeat of Raw. And then Ronda Rousey comes out there. Ah, and Mike, you know, not that great on the mic. She basically tells Liv, you know, understand, you know, being a champion is not as easy. You know, challenging for the title is easy, easier than being the champion. And Ronda's going to face Liv. But for now, because Natty is being a bitch, she faces Ronda. Ronda gets her win back. Blah, blah, blah. We get the Usos making quick work of Los Lotarios. Kayla Braxton brings up what happened at Money in the Bank with the Street Profits. That rematch is happening at SummerSlam. Spectacular match at Money in the Bank. We got to see what the stipulation will be. As I feel right now, Street Profits may need to get those belts at SummerSlam. I really think, you know, it's time for a little bit of a change. Then we get stupid shit. This is where I felt that they just did this to delay it a week. Because remember, we have two more SmackDowns before SummerSlam. And yes, the stipulation yesterday was not about SummerSlam. But they want to get this stipulation out of the way before SummerSlam. Basically, we're going to see Drew versus Sheamus again. The winner gets the undisputed championship match at Clash at the Castle. Now, we already know that Drew is getting the shot. But for storyline purposes, no, we're going to do a storyline where Sheamus possibly has. You already know the outcome. Remember a couple of weeks ago, I said that what WWE likes to do on SmackDown especially is, okay, I'm going to go down the road to the country store. you know. But instead of just taking the straight road, I go and I go around a couple of blocks. I take the scenic route. That's what they're doing. So to waste a week, they're teasing that whoever wins in this match is going to get the shot at Clash at the Castle. Seamus comes out for the match and he starts coughing. Oh, I got to get tested for COVID before I could have this match. So, Drew, you take on Butch instead. Drew beats Butch. Ridge tries to get involved. He gets his ass handed to him. Seamus tries to get involved and here comes the sword cutting the top rope again. And that's how we go off the air. It felt like other than maybe Gunther versus Shinsuke, because we already knew the Usos and the Street Profits are going to be a rematch. Yesterday was a week that you could have wasted. You could have wasted. Totally unnecessary. Totally unnecessary. I thought it was a waste of time. I mean, look, I liked some of the wrestling. Don't get me wrong. You know, my favorite part of the night. See, some of you thought I was going to forget about the tennis wear collection. Maximum male models. Hell, they even have a page now. You want to be a baddie? That's what it kind of reminds me of. You want to be a member of the maximum male models? Yeah, you could send the resume, send pictures, you know, just to get the fans a little bit interactive. People are telling me, hey, Don Tony, you should apply for maximum male models. For what? So I can embarrass myself on national TV? What do you want me to do? Lift my shirt up and show everyone that I have more roles than a fucking bakery? Come on. But the segment yesterday was spectacular. If you look at it closely, you can't really see it in this picture, but if you watch Mansoir come out, 
it looks like he's got a double penis in his pants. We were watching in a watch party yesterday. He has a bulge. It's almost like Shawn Michaels territory. He's got a bulge going north, I mean going east. And then you look close like, wait a minute, what's that in the other pocket? It's the way the pants were folded. It's the way the pants were folded. But if you look at it when he first comes out, it looks like he's got a penis pointing west and he's got a penis pointing east. It looked like he had a double penis in his pants. But they come out and they just nail it. They just freaking nail it. I'm telling you, Mansoir is loving this. The look, you feel it through the TV screen. You feel creeped the fuck out. And look, I don't eat my M&Ms with peanuts. I have no problem with anyone that does. But when you get that look and it goes through the screen and it feels like the person's looking at you, I'm like, okay. Uh, I'm feeling a little bit uncomfortable here right now, but they killed it yesterday. You know, we had a little bit of M&M vibes with all the photographers. Oh, look at Mansoir. He's fucking eating this shit up, titillating our juices, titillating our juices. Yeah, there you go. It was funny because Marseille was posing with the tennis racket yesterday. Look at look, look at that. I tell you, he, he's, he's, I'm telling you, Mansoir is really fucking taking this shit in. I never in a million years ever thought that he would be able to pull it off. But um, I thought they killed it yesterday. Just think about this, everyone. Let this sink in for a minute. Let this sink in for a minute. We got two guys playing some type of model thing. They're posing in tennis wear. It's kind of like... I don't know. I mean, I do know, but I'm not saying it here. You get that vibe from them. And majority of people online are enjoying it. What the fuck does that say about wrestling? That you can do goofy stuff. But if it's goofy stuff that, you know, you kind of rubs you the right way, you know, people are fine with it. I thought this was funny yesterday. I thought it was funny. I am not attracted to Mansoir. It's not Mansoir, Devin Stamp. It's Mansoir. And WWE, please, you got to listen to me. I promise you. I know I bring up stories from 25 years ago growing up Don Tony thousands of times over the years. But if you do it, I will not say it more than once that it was my idea. You got to call Ma Marseille. You got to say his name twice. I know we had Kelly Kelly. You could call him Massé Massé. It just sounds better. It sounds very French. I am Monse Monse. Say it twice. James with Mansois do the gimmick in Saudi Arabia. I'm not trying to be an asshole. Is he playing homosexual? just because he's walking in an arrogant, you know, modelish way, just kind of like showing off? Is that homosexual? I don't think so. But, but, I'm not singling you, but the vibe, the vibe I could get why some people may feel that way. But look, man, you ever watch runway models? I mean, look, the women on the runway models, you see, you know, foot before the foot, like they got to walk like this. and But the men, they all walk like this. And trust me, most, most of those men, you know, they are heterosexual. It's just the model mentality, the arrogance. Look at Rick Martell. Go back and watch Rick Martell when he was the model. And he used to walk to the ring. He used to do the same shit. Did anybody back then say, oh, Rick playing a little Finocchia? No. No. So anybody in Saudi Arabia that would get upset at that, I would think that would be pretty shallow on their part. So, but I don't think he would do the gimmick there. I don't think he would do the gimmick there because I think the Saudi fans would be like, the fuck are you doing to one of our heroes here? You're turning him into a model clown, you know? But remember also, remember also, Saudi Arabia does have male models there. If you go and you check, they do have male models. 
So, you know, it's c- kind of hard to say. Shout out to Sylvia Be- Biggs in the house tonight. Shout out. Thank you for the super, it's not super chat. What is that? Super photo? Super pick? Super pick. Super shout out. Super snapshot. I don't know. I, I'm drawing a blank right now. All right. So that was your episode of SmackDown yesterday. It's okay. It's okay. You know, super sticker. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, all right. So right now, your current lineup for SummerSlam is Reigns against Brock, last man standing. Pat McAfee versus Happy Corbin. By the way, Pat McAfee was not there yesterday. Yesterday, um, he could not appear. And, uh, you know, I thought the broadcast was fine without him. I mean, look, um, McAfee, to me, the best WWE announcer right now. I love how Michael Cole has been invigorated because of Pat McAfee. And uh, for those that don't know, WWE just signed a new deal with Pat McAfee, multi-year deal, not just commentating, but also multiple dates inside the ring. So Pat McAfee will be here for the foreseeable future. And and that's phenomenal. That's phenomenal because Pat McAfee, you know, I remember those early days that I despised this man. And I remember, remember the whole NXT stuff? And some of you were out there like, DT, give him a chance. Give him a chance. Just let him, you know, let it play out. And I was like, holy shit, you all were right. I was way off. You know, it was just that first WrestleMania appearance when he wore those shorts. I mean, I, I wanted to just, like, give him the atomic wedgie and hang him on a flagpole. But um, good for him. Good for him. Uh, Bobby Lashley versus Theory, rematch for the United States Championship. Usos versus the Street Profits, pretty much a lock. But we might have a stipulation. Might have a stipulation added to Remember, they didn't do a stipulation in the last match, and Street Profits were supposed to uh, get a stipulation choice, and it, they just swept it under the rug. They may hold it for now. Then you got Liv Morgan defending the SmackDown Women's Championship against Ronda Rousey. Happy seven-month anniversary, KC is raw. Much love. Um, want to show you something. Screenshot. Don't read much into it, everyone. Sasha Banks. Anybody that's got video right now, if you're looking at your screen, this is a screenshot of her Twitter profile, her main screen. And if you look at it, something changed a little bit. She now has WWE mentioned back in her bio. She has underneath her screen name, Sasha Banks, WWE, Casca Reeves, is this how you pronounce it? The Mandalorian? She remembered who she was, and the game changed. So people are now blowing up on social media. Oh, my God. She's mentioning WWE again. Oh, she's coming back. She's coming back. She mentioned WWE again. She's coming back. Look, it's pretty obvious that all those people online have revealed they do not have the sources in WWE that you always thought that they did. You know, they might have a friend of 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 a friend's neighbor but they don't have direct sources. I saw people name dropping some executive woman in WWE, which we've already talked about. All you had to do is go on WWE corporate site and just do a little research and say, who's in charge of processing terminations in WWE? And it's not just John Laurinaitis, you know, talent relations. No, they have executives. You know, the other guy, who was it, Kevin Dunn or whoever it was that, put the Mickey James stuff in the garbage bag. That's not even the part. So all you got to do is look it up. Oh, she's the one that did it. Yeah. Yeah. Because you look up and you see what people's duties are. You know, it's not hard to figure it out. They're not going to say, hey, Jose, come here. You doing anything? No, do me a favor. Get in touch with Sasha and say, look, you know, we're going to terminate her as of June 10th. 
No, they were people specifically there to do certain duties. So people have revealed, you don't have a fucking clue. The MJF stuff, people are deliberately swerving you right now by not staying on that story because Tony Khan wants it to develop into a storyline. If MJF is truly gone and was that unprofessional, you think Tony Khan would let it sit out there and not set an example and say that is totally unacceptable, uncalled for, that we are a family, we are this, we do and you know, unfortunately MJF, you know, thought that he was bigger than AEW itself. You don't think that he would turn around and want to address somebody totally embarrassing him and going into business for himself. He'd rather just say, I have no comment. I don't want to talk about it. 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 Can I hug you? Would a hug be acceptable instead? And people let it go. They let it fucking go. Nobody would have follow-up question. Tony, if he's gone, why wouldn't you want to just show everyone that that behavior is unacceptable? Just fuck up. Everybody looking. Let's just talk about it. People are lying to you because they want to feel like they're part of the storyline. So when the big reveal happens, people five years from now, oh, I remember when I purposely didn't do this so he could do Fuck you. Fuck you. So you see with the Sasha stuff, we don't know. The only people that know are WWE management, Sasha Banks. I don't even want to say attorneys. Talent agent, yes. Talent agent, yes. Because if you really start breaking it down, the amount of money that you would have to pay for a lawyer, I mean, come on. You think she's got this whole board of lawyers that she walks into a room? Yes, Mercedes. No. No, it's not like that at all. But we will hear something soon. We will definitely hear something soon. Bottom line is, her adding WWE in her profile, you want my honest opinion on it? I look at that more as her listing her resume. I don't know if she's going to be back. And I'm being honest. To me, when I look at that, I look at it as a resume. When she, if she's gone, hey, I'm Sasha Banks. I was Sasha Banks at WWE. My, actually, let me say it like this. My, my name is Mercedes Vernado. I was Sasha Banks in WWE. I was Casca Reeves in The Mandalorian. I remembered who I was. And the game changed. That's how I look at that. I look at it more of resume than anything else. But we should hear something very, very soon. We will. By the way, Kevin Owens made a surprise appearance during the NFL, uh, excuse me, the NHL draft. He was on Vancouver's TV for the Canucks. They have someone there by the name of Bruce Boudreaux, I believe it is. And he's a big WWE fan. And um, he was talking with Kevin Owens. This is, I think this is a better picture. Yeah, that's better. And Kevin Owens said that he will be back in a couple of weeks. Uh, apparently, some bumps and bruises. And uh, he hopes to be back in time for SummerSlam. So uh, we should see Kevin Owens, if not this Raw, I would say by next week's Raw, we should get Kevin Owens back on TV. So. Yeah, you know, I, I feel bad for Naomi out of all of this. I really do. Because, you know, as we said, Sasha Banks, her future outside of WWE seems a lot more solid, solidified. She's got Hollywood knocking on her doorstep. And you could see, I mean, I'm not a fan of the Mandalorian stuff or anything like that, but I saw some of what she did. She did a great job. Even if you feel. Sasha Banks is unprofessional, even if you don't like her. There's no denying Sasha Banks has a future in Hollywood. Naomi, though, doesn't feel the same. And Naomi, you could see, you could see even in some of her tweets, you know, for others, showing support for others, you could see that she misses it. And the thing is, if she leaves, do you think 
that AEW is going to roll out the red carpet and make her the nut. Look at, look at fucking Ember Moon, Athena. Have you watched AEW television the last couple of weeks? You know, it's all smoke and mirrors with Athena. They have done nothing. Did somebody stepped in shit with Thunder Rosa and Tony Storm. Ah! Thunderstorm! Oh, shirts, banners, you know, hashtags, Thunderstorm, Thunderstorm. Oh, my God, it's a perfect name, Thunderstorm. It's fate. It's fate. They can't even fucking utilize Britt Baker the right way anymore. What happened to Jamie Hayter? What happened to the friction between Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter? I think the only thing good out of this is that Rebel or Reba, whatever her name is, is not on TV as much anymore. Not the personal against her. You start putting this all together. Look at the crap you're seeing on TV. Look at the crap. Hey, Tony, how's about booking other than Serena Deeb and Mercedes Martinez? How's about giving us two or three matches for the Ring of Honor event? So you mean to tell me if Naomi goes to AEW, you think Trinity Fatu? You know, you know what people will want? And let's be totally honest, a lot of fans love Naomi. A lot of fans miss Naomi. I am a fan of Naomi. I miss her on TV also. I loved when she had that awesome main event match with Charlotte Flair not too long ago. To me, that was her match to tell the WWE office, yeah, I belong with all of the main eventers here in women's wrestling in WWE. I love that match. I miss her. But most people, if she goes to AEW, you know what they want to see? They want to get on the fucking mic and say, fuck you, Vince McMahon. Fuck you. That's what people want. And then when they don't get that because she is a professional and she wants to put a smile on her face and she just wants to entertain, what the fuck happens two weeks later? Well, we're going to get three weeks worth of pre-recorded interviews that are going to air once a week for three straight weeks to make us feel like, oh, she's on TV every week. Hey, Athena, we're going to record three interviews. We're going to spread it out over the next three weeks. What am I supposed to do over the next three weeks? Well, we got you on dark. Oh, who am I facing? Ruby Soho? Ah, oh, you always wanted to do it. No, you're going to face Lisa Lips. Okay. All right. In my book next week, yes. Who am I facing? You're facing Josie the Pussycat. But don't worry. In two months, you'll be 41 and three, and it'll feel like you're a big contender. Thank you, everybody, for the kind words. I'm a big fan of AEW, but I call it like it is, man. I don't do the chicken dance trying to rub elbows with, the, with uh, Mr. Khan and the others there. I tell it straight up. All right. So we got SmackDown out of the way. We got a couple of news tidbits out of the way. I know what you all want. Give me what I want. Give me what I need. Sorry, and happy 11-month anniversary, my friend. Let's talk about sex, baby. Bye-bye. Let's talk about Vince McMahon. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's not funny, but it is. You know, I had an impromptu exchange on social media early with Monty and Afaro. Great show. They do video. They do audio. Long Island's number one wrestling show. They kill it. Monty and Afaro. Everybody should support them. One day I want to be on their show. Monty, when are you going to invite me to Long Island? Eh. You could see I'm not afraid. I do video. You're going to bring me. You have those divorce beforehand? Some hors d'oeuvres? I don't like fish, though. I'd say nothing else. All right. Let's talk about Vince. Okay. I want to preface this with a super chat that came in. And I think it's very important that I mention this right off the bat. I want to make something clear. Big Sal, thank you for the 25 spot, my friend. What do I have to say about these women? who signed non-disclosure agreements and now singing like birds. Don't they deserve a little criticism for taking the money, spending it, then revealing it anyway? Okay. I'm going to just say it. I'm going to just say it. 
because now it's a big deal. Do you get a kick out of people the last 48 hours that we don't know who the woman was from 2005 that the latest scandal circles around? We have an idea who it is. We're probably right, too. But did you take note of all of those websites, social media accounts, podcasts that said, you know, we don't know who the victim actually was. We don't know who Vince McMahon coerced into a blowjob. Out of respect for that victim, that woman that was coerced and then released because she refused other sexual advances. Out of respect to that woman, that victim. We're not going to reveal her. Five minutes later, all you see on their pages is pictures of Christy Hemi. All of those people that are saying, oh, that is disgusting. You know, that person signed an NDA. And that person, that person has not come forward. And then they fill in the blank anyway. Christy Hemi, Christy Hemi, Christy Hemi, Christy Hemi, Christy Hemi, Christy Hemi. Every single one of them. You know what they fucking did? They tried to get a thousand likes by saying, you know, that person signed an NDA. And even though we know who it is, because that person has not said anything publicly, out of respect for that victim, we're not going to acknowledge her name. And after three hours that they only got 11 likes, the fuck? The fuck? Then they name drop Christy Hemi. Oh, we don't really know for sure, but we'll just talk about Christy Hemi anyway. Fuck you. Fuck you. They all did that to get hits, likes, attention. You will not see Christy Hemi's name written here at all about this. We don't know if it was Christy Hemi. But when I mentioned Monty and the Pharaoh early, I want to tell you why I say this. And this is Don Tony. This is Anthony de Blasi, who was doing podcasts, doing hotlines at the time a lot of this stuff was going down. When I saw the latest news that came out, what I immediately thought about was the whole culture of WWE in the early to mid 2000s. I didn't have to do one drop of research. You know what I immediately thought? Thought about Randy Orton shitting in Amy Weber's bag. Thought about Batista's dick. I thought about the signature pharmacy scandal. I thought about Vince McMahon, February 2006, Tanzabar, Florida. Hey, could you do me a favor? 22-year-old woman, I think 22. I, look, I'm looking at you. I'm not looking at notes. So I might have an age or a year wrong, but, I think, but this is from my memory. Florida, tanning salon, Vince McMahon, I think had a residence in Boca Raton at the time, separated from Linda. Not officially, not legally, but separated. Tells a 22-year-old female, alleged, hey, can you do me a favor? You take some pictures of me while I'm entertaining. I want to send it to my girlfriend. And he's buff. She's taking the pictures. You like what you see? You like? And apparently he made advances to the woman. She called the cops. Cops showed up. Gave, Vince gave a statement. Tanzabar. If you've never heard of this story, Google it. Go on Wayback Machine and go on my website, wrestling-news.com. Go to February 2006 and see what we covered at that time. At that time, there were reports that Linda and Vince McMahon were filing for divorce. Vince McMahon, that alleged incident. Now, look, he was found. Well, they never pursued charges. That's probably a better way for me to put it. Think of... Candace Michelle, think of Amy Weber, think of the Divas search. The Divas search started at this time. Think of Evolution, 
and all of the, you know, the the aura of, you know, banging late. You remember Evolution had a shirt said paid, made, laid. Do you remember that at the time the rumors were that Christy Hemi slept with Triple H? Not Vince McMahon. I remember it clearly. Anybody remember when Amy Weber accused Edge and Randy Orton of, I'll just say, abuse? You could Google it up. You could go check it out. In the early to mid-2000s for WWE, you had a culture of crazy-ass partying, a lot of sex. The Diva Search launched. Almost every non-wrestling female who was a Diva Search contestant, the ones that mattered, got a job. Christy Carmella, Christy Carmella. Anybody remember? People don't understand. That's what put me on the map back then. We predicted Christy Hemi winning the Diva Search three months before it happened. She was picked as the winner months earlier. And every week we were throwing facts out there before it even aired on TV. And when fans voted a certain way and WWE didn't like it, that's when you had immunity. That's when you had this. That's when you had that. You go back and you look at WWE in the early to mid-2000s. All you saw was partying, sex, a lot of steroids, a lot of questionable substances being used, a lot of infidelity. So when you hear in the last 24 hours that Vince McMahon coerced a female in 2005 into giving him a blowjob, and then when she refused more of Vince McMahon's um, advances, she was demoted and ultimately released. That is the story floating around. Now, getting back to what Big Sal said. Not one of these females have sung like birds as you wrote it. Not one female has made a public statement confirming any of what is floating around. I want to make that clear. So no one should have this idea that these women are banking millions, and then because there's an investigation, oh, let me have my cake and eat it too. If I was Vince McMahon and any of these women came forward and said, yeah, it was true, this is true, I would sue for, for, that, for the N NDA. I would sue. We made an agreement. Now, does that make Vince's behavior better? No. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. But if you remember... Back in the early to mid 2000s, we were talking about Vince McMahon making for, making out with Trish Stratus in front of Linda McMahon was acting like she was a vegetable in a wheelchair. A couple of weeks ago, we were talking about Eric Bischoff infatuated with Linda McMahon's tits. We talked about this for the last 17 plus years that I always thought that entire McMahon family had this weird perversion that were, you know, very sexual. I even made claims back then, and I thought Linda McMahon got aroused by seeing some of what she says. So the big thing that everybody should be talking about right now is why is Linda McMahon still married to Vince? They don't sleep with each other anymore. They don't spend much time with each other anymore. It's a marriage by convenience. You remember when I compared it to Melania and Donald Trump? Remember when I compared it to Bill and Hillary Clinton? They should all go out on a triple date because they mirror each other more than you realize. So now I'm going to say something that is going to upset some of you. And I'm sorry if it does. I'm very, very honest on these shows. I don't clickbait. I don't tell you something to garner a reaction or to trigger you or to make you. No, I tell you exactly how I feel. This is my opinion about it. The female. That has come out. Oh, let me say one last thing. So no one, no females are spilling the beans. The reason why this information is being made public now is because 
the investigation that is going on with these outside companies, they're looking at every bank transaction that Vince McMahon has done. And they are finding, hey, Vince, what is this $1 million payout for? And he is answering honestly. Vince, what is this $7.5 million payout you made in 2018? Gee, I wonder what was going down around 2018. Rumors of Saudi Arabia? Rumors of a billion-dollar TV deal? You can't have that stuff go out. So what I'm saying right now is probably not upsetting anyone, but here, here it comes. Here it comes. We don't know who the female was that in 2005 was a WWE diva. In 2005, Vince manipulated her into giving him oral sex. When she refused additional advances, she got demoted and ultimately released. It was a publicly traded company at that time. That would have caused chaos. Vince probably would have been long gone out of WWE way back when. But she left. She left. And all of these years, we have heard no accusations of such. Okay. Now I say what I will probably upset a lot of people. That same woman in 2018 got paid seven point. $5 million. Why was an NDA negotiated 13 years after this happened? In my opinion, I'm from the outside looking in. Whoever this female is, on the surface, I think committed blackmail. Saw the momentum, the $100 stock, so all of the dealings that WWE was doing and the rumored other dealings, and it feels like, to me as an outsider looking in, it feels like that this person after 13 years, hey, Vince, I see you're making billions. I see there's rumors of making these deals. Well, guess what? If we don't come up with an agreement, I'm telling everything. Vince paid this person $7.5 million. I see some of the names you're pulling in the chat, and I'm not going to deny one of the names that is coming up by multiple of you, I think might be one as well, but I don't know. So I will not claim that it's one or the other. I'm not going to sit here and do that. We don't know who it actually is. We probably do, but until we know for sure, I'm not going to throw that person under the bus. But I am very, very disturbed that after 13 years, somebody got paid $7.5 million to keep their mouth shut. I don't think Vince, in my opinion, after 13 years, decided to call this person up and said, hey, we're going to do a billion-dollar deal. I just want to make sure you're not going to open your mouth. So how's about I give you $7.5 million to keep it shut? To me, that looks like blackmail. I'm not condoning any of Vince's actions. Vince is disgusting. Vince is a chauvinistic pig. Vince McMahon, again, I give him props, in his 70s, still wanting it. But you look at it, he's got not getting it from Linda. He's not going to, you know, go and hire an escort. Shit. You cough in his, in his room. <laughs> ah! You know, that guy is a little bit of a freak. So instead, he'd rather buy $13 million of pussy. You know, instead of maybe just having some normal relations. But, you know, someone, someone who I talk to privately, and I will tell you firsthand that this person um, is involved with someone who used to work for WWE. And this female has made it clear Vince never made advances to her. Not going to say who it is. But 
you know, the person said to me that the aura, the climate of WWE back in the early to mid 2000s is here's Vince in his 50s, a lot of testosterone, a lot of, you know, partying, as we said before, and he ain't getting it at home. So he sees all these diva search women parading their asses in front of him. He sees some of them who did do nude videos. We don't need to go there. But you remember what we, what we uncovered back then, all the feet stuff? You know, what was it? Ivox? Is that the video company? And Vince sees all this sexuality in front of him. And he can't help himself. I'm not justifying it. I'm trying to understand it. So now what's come out is that over the last 16 years, 16 years, which would be 2006. So it really should be 17 years. Let's make that clear. But over the last 16 years, since 2006, Vince McMahon made payouts of $7.5 million, $3 million, $1 million, and $1 million four women one was an employee hired and then let go during covid one is the female from 2005 that we just talked about and the other two women we don't know who they are and we don't know exactly what years they were but these are payouts that he gave in return for ndas do not talk about it so that's the latest scandal. But let me remind everyone that, did you see all the websites this week that said, oh, the climate behind the scenes in WWE is that nobody's surprised by this? Of course not. Every in their, everybody and their mother back then thought that Vince was what he was. He played it out on TV. Look at the picture that's on the screen. I mean, go Google it and see Vince in public with Stacy Keebler, you know, just joking around about the size of her legs. He's got his hands on her legs and stuff like that. He didn't do anything with Stacy Keebler. I want to make that clear. None that I'm aware of. But he's doing storylines on TV, and he's getting away with it because, hey, it's Mr. McMahon. Just like when you have wrestlers in AEW that, you know, call people fat and make fun of people in the crowd, and everybody's like, you know, that's awful to do that. They're just playing characters you know, from this time to this time. When you see stuff in WWE and you see some outrageous, be it, well, no, this is just entertainment. From this, from 8 to 10, 9 to 11, 8 to 11, you know, they're just characters on TV. This is just entertainment. That's not real life. So back then, you saw all the diva search. You saw the signature pharmacy scandal. You saw Tanzibar. You saw... Uh, the situation with Amy Weber and her bag and then Edge and Randy Orton with Amy Weber. You see some of the other non-wrestlers, Joy Giovanni and others, who, you know, at that time, then you remember that John Laurinaitis, we talked about it many times back then, that Johnny Ace would open up women's model magazines. I want her. We got to call her. We got to get her. Oh, my God, we got to get her. You had people that worked in the office that were fooling around with some of these girls. I'm not going to mention relationships. That whole climate in WWE from the early to mid-2000s was filled with this. Vince wasn't the only one. That's why so many people are keeping their mouth shut. Because there are so many stories from a lot of your favorite Hall of Famers and soon-to-be Hall of Famers that were doing shit like this. How many of those Greg Oliver you shoots or whatever talking about Batista's dick? And it's, I'm not saying that Batista did anything wrong, but if you go back during that time, it's nothing but sex, partying, and steroids. That's what it was. Once Tanzibar happened, I think it put a scare in Vince McMahon like, fuck, I got to be a little bit more careful with this. Then you had Signature Pharmacy, that scandal. And then you had, unfortunately, Eddie's death. And then you had the Chris Benoit. Uh, murder suicide and then you add the trials you had the the situation with court you know there was a lot of those things pretty much put the fire out and then they went pg they went pg but if you remember even when they first started going pg 
Degeneration X. Didn't they do a skit on TV where we thought Carm uh uh, Candace Michelle was under the table giving oral sex to someone. Now you look back and it's like, was that a shot on Vince McMahon? See, nobody out there is thinking about anything that I'm saying right now because most of them, and it's not their fault, most of them didn't live through this. They think by watching YouTube videos and shoot interviews and reading old news articles that they can fill in the blanks and suddenly, yeah, you remember this, remember this, remember this? No. If you live through it and you talk about it every single week, no, it kind of puts everything together. That's why this Vince McMahon story is not as big of a story as you think. Vince got away with being a pig for well over 15 years. Vince McMahon now is almost 80 years old. If WWE in 2022 or 2023 says Vince can't be on the board of directors anymore, that motherfucker is going to go in his, in his, in his, house and pour a bottle of champagne pour a glass of champagne and say i i did it my way i think at 80 years old that this is a tragic devastating thing for vince mcmahon you think you're going to see people on social media going to think like they scored this gigantic victory we finally got the pig out of office who the fuck is 80 years old what do you think how many years do you think he was going to be back there anyway he had his fun he had the power. He has millions. He could afford what he did. You know, and a lot of people are jealous of it. A lot of people are angry of it. A lot of people are just disgusting, disgusted by it. But you see a lot of these people online that are absolutely offended by it. The people that are over the top offended are probably some of the biggest violators or would love to have been in that position. If I was a woman, I would not want to go with Vince. But this is what happens. This is what happens in the entertainment world. This is what happens with billionaires and millionaires. And there are women out there. Again, again, what happened to that woman in 2005 was awful, if true. But I also feel that 13 years later, turn around and say, pay me, bitch. Remember that in 2005? All I got to do is go on one website and let's see how those deals with Saudi Arabia and Fox and everything else go. Oh, the rumor deals. So let's not immediately say, oh my God, they're so victims, 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 victims. How do you know those other three women didn't enjoy doing it as well? Look at the culture at that time. So. That is what's going on with Vince. Now, speaking of victims, Jesus. I can't even believe that we're going to talk about this, but we have to. Sympathy for the devil. Chris Benoit. Now, hear me out before you immediately judge what I'm going to say. Jordan Grace um, made some comments the last couple of days that Chris Benoit, because of his mind turning into mush, he would not be able to hang with the wrestlers of today. Now, I'm not going to criticize her, praise her, agree, disagree. What I, what I will say is this. If you look at her comment, it feels like there's a giant paragraph that's missing in what she said. You can't just go like, oh, he would not be able to keep up with people today. Oh, burn in hell. It feels like there was a whole paragraph that's missing in there. So in my opinion, she probably should have typed this on Instagram or Facebook or typed it on a screen, screenshot it, and then post a picture of your entire thing. But to go from one extreme to the other, I don't know, just felt like messy. Well, oh, that opened the fucking floodgates. It opened the floodgates. This reminds me of that stupid moronic tweet. Eddie Greer was a B-plus player from some random schmuck on social media that was looking for conversation. We know what Eddie Guerrero was and what he wasn't. But because everybody out there had to 
in 320 characters tell us why Eddie is, was such an amazing person, an amazing wrestler. They were just looking for the heart emojis. Oh my God, I agree with you 100%. Can we be friends? Oh my God, 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 oh my God. Look, 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 look. All these people are liking my stuff. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Instead of just ignoring someone who writes something stupid, a million people have to respond because they all want to write the perfect tribute to Eddie Guerrero. They, they think that one day when it's their time to go and they're at the pearly gates, they think Eddie Guerrero's going to greet them at the gates and say, hey, man, fucking love what you wrote about me on Twitter. Viva la raza. Eddie Guerrero was amazing. Beloved. Eddie Guerrero was fucking awesome. And when I saw that B-plus play, go look at my social media. I never responded to it. I was like, okay, either this person is either too young to understand or intentionally trying to just create conversation. Well, shit happened again. Shit happened again with Chris Benoit. There were many people who wrote dumb shit in the last couple of days. But I'm going to show you one. And I blurred out his name and his picture for one reason and one reason only. I'll show it to you in a second. Because when he wrote what he wrote, I respect people's opinions. But when I see someone who's intentionally writing something to try to get conversation, every response within two minutes, he's writing a, com he's writing a response back. This guy was looking to get noticed and try to get as much conversation with people online as possible. And this was the poster child. This is the leader of Bizarro Land. Bizarro Land just got a whole bunch of new residences, residents, and this guy is the leader of it. It's a picture of Chris Benoit holding the championship. And it says, this man's life should be recognized by WWE. Bring awareness to those struggling with mental health and CTE. His work warrants a Hall of Fame induction, one of the best and highly regarded in his years. Respect Chris Benoit. There's almost 700 likes when I took this screenshot. Let me make this clear. Friends of Chris Benoit. People who are very close with Chris Benoit. People who interacted with Chris Benoit. 99% of them say he was an amazing man, was a kind man, was a wonderful man. Those people I do not blame who look at Chris Benoit and just can't accept the fact that he killed his wife, strangled his wife, and suffocated his son. I understand that the Benoit family wants an answer. Wants an answer. Problem is, you ain't getting one. And unless Chris Benoit shows up in your house like some fucking crazy version of the movie Ghost, you don't know if the CTE actually led him to strangling his wife and suffocating his son. There are millions of people who battle CTE that do not murder anybody. You're going to blame it on concussions. Who the fuck continued to do headbutt after headbutt after headbutt after headbutt? Well, WWE allowed him. Wait, let me get this straight. So someone who develops an illness or a disability because of an addiction, steroids, in-ring work, chairs to the head, tackles on a football field, because of an illness that transpired, because of that, we should show a little sympathy. This was not Chris Benoit. This is the result of what happened. Well, tell me what's the difference between a drug addict. Tell me what's the difference between an alcoholic. Tell me what's the difference within someone who is good that develops an addiction. 
is the most beautiful, kindest person you ever met. And because the addiction takes over and they murder people for money or they get desperate and they just fucking kill someone, why do we not have sympathy for them? Why? Because Chris Benoit was such a wonderful wrestler. Because we have so many, but you don't think I fucking loved Chris Benoit's work at that time? I got a whole catalog of doing shows going back to 1997. But the man fucking killed his wife and his son. And you could think that, oh, the CTE did it. The steroids did it. The chair shots did it. The fuck gave you? Who be, who, how did you become God? There are a lot of people out there who have no illness and kill people. What do you say about that? Oh, well, it had to have been this. It had to be that. You know, back in 2007, there's an infamous episode. We were doing a Minority Report podcast at the time, and it's still online. And you know, I take pride that for 25 years, I've been doing stuff right after Raw goes off the air. And in 2007, when we learned of the family's deaths, we didn't know at the beginning of our show that Chris Benoit murdered his family. WWE at that time was doing a tribute show for Chris Benoit. We went into the show preparing to pay tribute for Chris Benoit. We thought it was a triple murder. By the time we finished the show, we knew what it was. And we were trying to come up with all different answers. Now, we obviously didn't know about CTE at the time. His brain wasn't examined, you know, it's within hours. One of the early stories going around and I know this is horrible to say, but I got to say it. One of the early stories going around is that Nancy was not the nicest person in the world. Now, let me make this clear. We said on that night, we said weeks after, months after, I don't care how much of a bitch she may have been. She didn't deserve to die. Didn't deserve to die. But the early story going around is that she was going to leave Chris and she was going to take everything. And she was throwing it in Chris's face. I'm taking your son. I'm taking how I'm taking everything. I'm leaving you with nothing. And some people think that that made him snap and he killed her. Had no intention on killing his son, but he killed her. He strangled her. It's not like he was sleepwalking. It's not like he thought he was at a WWE pay-per-view. How come he didn't strangle anyone else in the ring? How come a week before, two weeks before? There was no signs whatsoever. You know, he's in the ring and he's fighting it out. Maybe for a split-second lapse. And people are like, what the fuck are you doing? What the fuck am I doing? Something made him snap that night. We don't know who it is. We don't. But people now, because of all these studies, because they want to convince themselves that it could not have been Nancy, could not have been a bad relationship. How many people have you seen on the news in the last 17 years where a husband kills his wife, wife kills the husband? You know, they try to plot. Because the relationship is full, out of you know, somebody gets pregnant. We just had one on the news the other day, because a, a woman in New York City rolling around with a stroller because the guy didn't want to pay child support shot her in the head. So people out there don't want to just say, "Man, something made him fucking snap that night." And unfortunately, we don't know what it is. The good people out there that loved Chris Benoit that knew him personally that said, this is not the person I knew. They would love to go to sleep at night and say, the CTE did it, the steroids did it, the chair shots, the headbutts, this did it. Thank, thank you. Know, it's horrible what happened with Nancy. It shouldn't have happened with his son, but at least they have closure. The Benoit family wants closure. They want to put a closing to this book that it was CTE, that it was steroids, that it was this, 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 this. And that's why he did it. At the end of the day, we will never know.
period. So as much as you want to believe that it was this or this or this, no one will ever know the answer. That is why, whether it's one year later, five years later, 17 years later, Chris Benoit will never be celebrated by WWE, is not a Hall of Famer. Just because you love this fucking wrestling and you believe it was CT or you believe it was steroids or something else, you know, you don't, it doesn't give you, just because he was a great guy his entire life, doesn't give you, you know, credits to offset the violence. There's been so many murders and so many crimes on TV and you interview the neighbors, you interview the relatives. Well, he was a good guy. He was a good guy. I never got on. He was fine. He was great. I never, just shocked to me. You think that there is, no, no. It's awful what happened. It's awful. It's almost, we can't believe it. I mean, it's like, how do you do that? Because we're not killers. We're not murderers. We're not, we don't have those thoughts. We'll never understand it. But I totally respect and I totally understand the people who are close with Chris Benoit that want closure, that want to believe that the man I knew could not do this. And I totally respect that view. At the end of the day, though, unfortunately, doesn't matter if it's your favorite wrestler. Doesn't matter if it's your son. Doesn't matter if it's your father, your mother, your neighbor, your ex-boyfriend, your ex-girlfriend, your sister, your best friend. It doesn't matter when someone commits that kind of a crime unless they leave a note, unless they detail it, why they did this and why they did that, why they did this, you don't know the answer. You don't know the answer. I've watched so many episodes of Forensic Files where somebody, I, I watched the list murders again the other day for the 15th time. You know, and the guy in his head, you know, had this justification that his, he was bringing his family in a better place, that they were not going to be able to deal with the world the way it was. In his mind, he was convinced. Ain't no fucking CTE. There ain't no fucking chair shots to the head. You know, you can't explain it. There's never going to be an explanation. And just because it's been 15 years or 50 years doesn't take away the fact that somebody strangled his wife and suffocated a child. A child. That's it. That's it. No Hall of Fame. No celebration. Tragedy. Great fucking wrestler. Well-liked by his peers. Got along with everyone. And it just doesn't make sense why he did what he did. Period. Anything after that is people trying to convince themselves. Yet they're trying to finish the chapter. It's like an author who writes a book, they're on the last chapter, and then they die. You try to finish that chapter thinking that you know what that author was going to close it as. Unfortunately, you can't. You can convince yourself. You could be 99.9% .9 convinced that this is the reason why. Well, guess what? You ain't God. And nobody fucking knows. You will never know. And that's why Chris Benoit, it will never change. He murdered his wife. He murdered his son. It's tragic. It's awful. We wish it never happened. And that's it. Period. Not, oh, I could celebrate the rest of this. Then you could say that for a drug addict who totally ruins his life, and the drugs take out. Say it about a drug addict. Say about someone with mental health. Say about someone who blows up a building, shoots up a store, does all this stuff. Oh, he was battling depression, battling this. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, so we should show a little sympathy for him. All right. I'm going to get out of here. We are at 90 minutes. Before I get out of here, we have... Uh, Oh, we could, we could, you know what? I really was supposed to finish at 90 minutes today. We got to start getting done in 60 to 90 minutes because I'm going to be going live soon on Pro Wrestling TV and I have to finish shows within an allotted time because there's going to be shows going live right after me and I can't have them sit and wait and lose five, 10 minutes. It's like a TV guide. 
you know, you set your times, we got to start. So today was a little different, but we'll stay 15 more minutes in case anybody has any particular questions. Let me just shout out some friends in the super chats and then I'll spend a couple of minutes in the chat room as well. Tomorrow night, don't forget, we're right back here. Tomorrow night, a lot of Q&A, a lot of live discussion. So a lot of what you may, let this sink in a little bit. Vince, Chris, whatever you want, follow it up tomorrow. Chris Kutra says, even if Chris Benoit had CTE, when he did what he did, doesn't mean that he had no choice in murdering two people. The only ones with no choice were his wife and his son. Yeah. I remember Paul Heyman doing a video about three years ago said it's very similar. There's no doubt he brutally killed two people. He deserves no sympathy. Spot on. Spot on. See, you want to give sympathy for people that you like people that you admire, people that you enjoyed, whether it was a personal connection or as a fan, whatever it is. So when it's someone you like, you don't want to accept why they did what they did. And I totally get that. Totally get that. But unfortunately, that's not the way it works. As much as we don't want to accept that, the Benoit family could, could have convinced himself this is why he did what he did. No, that's not why he did what he did. You don't know. You don't know. You could blame it on this, blame it on that, blame it on this, but you don't know. There was anger that night. There was a crazy amount of anger that night. What caused that anger? It's not normal for somebody to commit murder on someone. And you just, you, you'll never know. You'll never know. Chris also says another thing about Benoit. Give it over, get over this Hall of Fame crap. It's been 15 years. Everyone get over their Benoit work rate boners. I agree with you. You don't think I would love to have celebrated Chris Benoit and still look back and talk about his matches. Problem is, I can't. I can't. I'm not one of those that's going to say, oh, my God, you know, what a tragedy. But he was an unbelievable wrestler. Because that's an, an escape for a lot of people out there. Gee, you know, I don't really, you know, like I want to celebrate Chris Benoit. Well, how do I do that? Well, I could just say, wow, it's awful what he did and it sucks and CTE is very, very ser serious, but there's no denying he was an amazing person in the ring and this and that. So it's like, okay, let me say this first and then I can fucking still praise his career. Um, you do that about OJ Simpson. Do it about a drug addict. Do it about someone who totally fucked up their life, was a good person. And you see how people react to you and then you, you realize the difference. So... Uh, shout out to Big Sal again. Casey is raw. What about using a Money in the Bank contract to split up the belts, either for the WWE belt or the Universal belt? No, you know, I like the idea. I like the idea, but the thing is, you know, the, the briefcase is for a title shot. It's not for an individual title, choose your brand, choose this, choose that. If it was, it'd be different. But right now, WWE's the match with Brock Lesnar, they're treating it as a singular championship, but Roman's coming out with two belts. Um, remember early on, people were saying that WWE was going to debut an undisputed championship? I wish they did. I wish they did. Because that would make more sense. But remember the Usos? That they were going to Unify the tiles and they were going to get rid of the belts and only have one set of tiles. Remember somebody even like Photoshop something on online. That's because they wanted the roster split to end. But the Usos are still coming out with two championships because walking around with four belts looks better than walking around for two belts. Ask FD, FTR that. So the fact that they keep coming out with a blue belt and a blue belt. Wait, did I just say blue twice? A red belt and a blue belt. They, they are going to be going back to their original destinations. The question is, when does WWE do it? I expected a storyline. I expect 
something as ridiculously simple as Roman Reigns is in the ring. I beat Brock Lesnar, last man standing. There's no one else. Acknowledge me. Acknowledge me. Music hits. Somebody comes out from Raw. Challenges. Someone else's music hits, comes out from SmackDown. Challenges. Then you get Adam Pierce. I have an idea. So-and-so will battle Roman Reigns for the WWE Championship. <sighs> but Roman Reigns will battle so-and-so for the Universal Championship. I think that's how it's going to go. I think that's the ultimate, the, the eventual ending of this. Because if they were not going to split those titles up again, they would not be coming out with multiple brand belts anymore. There would be a brand new championship, a coronation, brand new title, undisputed championship, and that's it. But they keep coming out with duplicate titles, double titles, because it looks better. And because eventually when this storyline runs its course, let's also be honest. The tag team division sucks. So they don't want two brands of champions. When that tag team division gets a little bit stronger and they think, okay, Rock has enough teams, SmackDown has enough teams, that's when you'll see them split back. So uh, shout out to AS7607. Much love to you. I did not do the watch party. We're going to do it on Monday. We never do it on Saturdays because the weekend. But, yeah, yesterday... We had an incredible turnout for the SmackDown and Rampage watch parties. We're giving away, remember that Undertaker wall talker from 1998, the 3D one? Someone is going to win that and an autographed photo of the Undertaker. So that will be on Monday. And uh, like I said, as long as the watch parties get bigger, the giveaways will get bigger. So eventually I think we're going to have a giveaway for everybody who's on the stage and a smaller giveaway for everybody who is not. So I think that is where we're going with that. But yesterday, tremendous turnout. And everybody has a great time. We had like seven different people talking at the same time. And guess what? It was a wonderful conversation and nobody talked over anybody for the most part. So definitely Monday. Casey is raw again. Vince needs to pay these women for dealing with his old penis. He definitely wouldn't do it for free. Listen, man, you know, when you're around millionaires and billionaires and you know that they're millionaires and billionaires i guarantee you there's a lot of women and men in this world that see dollar signs you know just because someone sounds like a dirty old man and that ruffles your morals well for the guys out there one day you will be a dirty old man and trust me you know i have Ask myself this question over the last couple of weeks. DT, if I live to be 78 years old and I'm no longer with my fiance and I'm wherever I am and someone who is 30 years younger than me finds me somewhat attractive and wants to do it, even if it's somebody in my work environment, would I turn around and say no? When I turn around and say, man, I could fucking die tomorrow. I'm 78 years old. You bet your sweet ass. I'm going to take that wooden spoon. There you go. There you go. Right. Yeah, bitch. One day we're going to be shriveled old, and we might be very, very lonely. And someone who makes you feel younger might invigorate you. I'm not justifying what Vince said. But, you know, for people that think that here is a billionaire that is using a casting couch and trying to get people to make his knob wet, you know, and everybody is an absolute victim, you know, I keep thinking to myself, wait a minute. Someone, Vince McMahon did this to you in 2005. And I get it. Maybe you didn't say anything because you wanted to stay in wrestling and you thought you'd be blackballed. A lot of people thought that about Rita way back when. But 13 years later, I can't help but to say to myself, oh, that ship has sailed, honey. If you were that upset about it and it was that awful and criminal, there ain't no job 
that is worth me allowing someone to continue to do that to other women for 13 more years and make billions. And then when they're about to ink a deal, say, you know what? I'm tortured by this. Vince, I know it's been 13 years, but if you don't do something for me, show me that you're sorry, I'm going to tell the whole world. How much, how much can I give you? Would you like seven and a half million of these? Can't help but to think about that part. You know, I watched a guy today. Watch the guy today. I didn't want to mention this, but I'm going to mention it. I don't remember the guy's name. Indie wrestler. And he's trying to get a trainer blackballed from wrestling. And he talks about how that this trainer, many, many years ago, took a 16-year-old, someone in the chat may know who I'm talking about already, took a 16-year-old and just wanted to become a wrestler. And this guy put the 16-year-old in the ring, made him wrestle barefoot, put him in a pile driver move, and kind of like slapped his ass and did a few things and wrote like seven screenshots of all this stuff. Now, let me make this clear. The wrestler that wrote this today is not the 16-year-old at the time. He witnessed this. And I say to myself, that was so fucking disturbing and you're only saying it now? If you turn around and see something beyond awful, pedophilic, if that's even a word, and you feel your career, that you might be blackballed if you kiss it, you feel that that's more important? Well, go fuck yourself. You see something that awful and then you wait years and then you post all these screenshots, oh, that's fucking awful, I'm so sorry for you. That. Fuck you. Fuck you. That 16-year-old never got any type of, uh, uh, what, how do I even put this? Didn't get any um, retaliation. Didn't get any, uh, you know, satisfaction. The fucking trainer went on to train lots of other people, and after all these years, nobody, nobody knows who it is. I can't remember the guy's name. But it'll, you'll see it, trust me, you'll see a lot of wrestling websites that suddenly will give a shit about this story simply because it's controversial and, hey, it'll get us hits and views. Give it, a, give it a day. You'll see it everywhere. But I read this, and it was an awful thing. Don't get me wrong. It was awful. And, it's, and I believe the guy. But I'm saying to myself, you didn't fucking say nothing for all of these years? Fuck you. Fuck you. You let someone do that to a 16-year-old and you worried about your career a little bit more? Fuck you. After all these years, you either just don't say it anymore, you know, or you turn around and you admit it. Say, look, I didn't say anything because I thought I would, you know, lose opportunities elsewhere. You know, still doesn't make it right, but at least people be like, you know what? Props to you for being honest. So, yeah, if it's wrong, it's wrong. You don't wait all these years and try to like bring it up now to make you seem like you're some champion against abuse. Fuck you. Fuck you. You tried to make a career out of yourself for the last bunch of years and now it didn't work out. Your name is, I don't never heard of this guy's name before. And I'm like, you're bringing it up now? Go fuck yourself. So, all right. Very quickly, if anybody has any quick questions in the chat, related to tonight, obviously. Ask or forever hold your peace till at least tomorrow night, 8.05 p.m. We'll be back for the sit-down. Tomorrow, I'm hoping to try to do the show in 60 minutes. Want to test an hour and see if we can really cram in a whole ton of shit. All right, I'm waiting for the chat. Should the board fire Vince McMahon? I think Vince McMahon, here's my prediction. It's a good question. Here's my prediction out of all of this. Oh, and I, I want to finish up the show with something about Ric Flair, Kevin Kraft, 
Shout out to him. I'll explain why in a minute. In my prediction, I think Vince McMahon will permanently resign. I think Vince McMahon, and I honestly think WWE will tell Vince, Vince, save yourself the embarrassment of the board voting you out. Just permanently resign. Just tell everyone that you're going to focus on creative or you're going to spend the time you have left with your family and take a step back and how much you love pro wrestling and love WWE and you don't ever want to walk away from it. But they will save him the humility of being voted off to be voted out. He will permanently step aside. He will permanently walk away from the board of directors. He will be out as CEO permanently. That's what I believe will happen. Yeah, Vince still owns a majority in WWE. And if I was him, I would never get rid of my majority. Never. But I still believe Vince, WWE will tell Vince, Vince, save the humility of the board of directors voting you out. Just permanently resign. That's what I believe is going to happen. Remember that too. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Who takes over if Vince steps down? Stephanie. Stephanie, CEO of a billion dollar company. I mean, the power itself. And let me, let me also say this. You don't think the investors see the writing on the wall? Vince is 78 years old. The fucking guy could die tomorrow. They see the writing on the wall. They know that WWE's imminent future is going to be without Vince at the helm. They're not holding out hope. They're not turning around and saying, he's a genetic jackhammer. He's going to live to be 100. They're not going to do that. They know. And the stock is doing fine. I saw some people trying to like clickbait about the stock the last seven days. Yeah, it went down 3%. Yeah, go look at overall for the month. It's still up. You know, it's, you know, people just want to pay attention to stock when it's negative so they could have a reason to shit on it. Um, I do want to shit on something randomly. NXT Great American Bash rating came in. It was late because of the holiday this week. It only did 593. That is up from last week's 570. But to me, that is a tremendous disappointment. And I got news for you. I'm going to go there and say it. I don't think Braun Breaker is this big ratings draw that people think it is. I think the overall product is what is attracting fans to tune in more than anything else. I think some of uh, what we see on NXT is the, some people think that that's the draw. I don't think so. But I will say this, the 593 that the Great American Bash drew this week is their average rating for 2022. NXT's average rating for 2022 is 5. 93. So they hit their average, but the fact that it was almost like a premium live event for NXT levels, that's a disappointing number. And it was the day after the 4th of July, so you can't even blame it on the holiday. So, uh, Let's see. If Vince leaves, can Kevin Dunn go too? Um, you want to know something? I think you will see a little bit of a turnaround with management. There are some people there who are Vince Vince go-to guys, so I definitely see a few people out. Not as many as you think. You know, some that I think people don't realize, WWE, you know how many employees WWE has? I think about 900. So, you know, you, there's some big names, obviously, but you'll see a small turnover. And some change, change is always good. You will see some names remain. You know, you're not going to rock the boat that much right away. But uh, could Kevin Dunn be one of them? Possible. I don't hate Kevin Dunn. I don't hate Kevin Dunn. I, he's got a very, very tough job to do. And it's not a job where you win favoritisms, you know, like a popularity contest with employees. You know, there are roles that some people have that are just, you know, they are what they are. So I don't hate them. 
I don't hate him at all. VJ's asking, do I think Vince will abruptly sell a company if he has to step down? Listen, Vince knows. Vince sees the writing on the wall. WWE, you uncover this. You know, you can't turn around and say, you go, Vince. That board of directors, you know, they can't be looking at this and saying, ah, it's Vince being Vince. A lot of that is from years ago. You know, a lot of that's from years ago. A lot of what Vince did in the 2000s is coming back to haunt them a little bit. It's what happens when you got a lot of money. But I think no way Vince tries to sell the company out of spite or something. No, no. Vince wants WWE to last forever. And it, and it will last through his daughter and if Shane returns and Triple H and others. And, you know, Vince wants WWE to... to to last forever now you know if a company comes along comes along and makes a crazy offer to buy wwe you know as nick khan said you know they're not looking to sell but they'll listen to any offer somebody comes over and wait, grossly overpays for wwe they would sell in a second they would sell in a second i i don't know if shane would return i don't know if shane would return um, very quickly, I just wanted to mention because, you know, we did a Patreon show on Tuesday. Our uh, elite channel members, they got you have access to the show also. But question that came in after I did the show from Kevin Kraft was asking about Ric Flair's opponent for his final match at the July 31st. And we've thrown around a couple of names before. It has not been revealed and I do not expect the name to be revealed unless somebody spoils it. But I believe there is only one person that should be facing Ric Flair for his last ever match. And I know most of you out there already know who I'm about to say. I think it's obvious. I think it's common sense. I think it's the only way to go. It's got to be Sting. It's got to be Sting. You see what he does in AEW. You know, Sting does not fight like Sting, WCW Sting. Sting fights like someone who can't do anything like he did before, so he brawls. Sting fights like a lot of us would if we just broke into wrestling. Like you would do like hardcore stuff, you would do dives. You would do like just like a whole bunch of punches and this and that. I mean, you might do a bump here and there. But Sting, and and I don't blame Sting. Sting, for his age and his body, you know, is doing a beautiful job right now. And I think Sting is the only person that it should be. The only person. I think if it's not Sting, I think it would only be because Sting is worried about Ric Flair's health. That's the only reason why I think if it's not Sting, I think it would only be because Sting is too concerned about Ric Flair's health. But I also feel that if, if Sting accepts the responsibility, I think Sting will protect Ric Flair big time. And I also expect some clusterfuck interference. I expect numerous people from Ric Flair's past to get involved in the match. I expect Arn Anderson to, to cheap shot someone. I expect Tully Blanchard to show up. I expect, expect others. This will not be a one-on-one -on -one match, period. You will see a lot of people interfering. A lot. And that will cover up, and it will also help Ric Flair a little bit. So, um... Imagine if Vince lives to be 100. I know, man. I know. You know, look, anything is possible. Anything is possible. I would love to live to be 100. Seriously. I don't care if I have to, like, eat out of a straw. Seriously. I would love to be able to live to be 100. But like I tell people nowadays, you know, I'm old. I'm in my 50s now. You know, I may have 30 years left i may have 30 minutes left and that's why i've really really come over the last six weeks 
really to a peacefulness that, you know, as far as haters and, you know, gripes and this and that, it's not worth it, man. Getting married in less than two months. We're the number one show on pro wrestling TV right now. After one month being there, you know, we got so much momentum, having so much fun, great laughs, great times. Like how, how do you not want more of that? So that's why, you know, what you see is what you get. I don't, I don't like drama. So I think people realize that. All right. I don't know why people say 13 days with MJF, I'm assuming. I don't know what MLF is. But Martin Luther thing, I, I, MLF, MJF, Martin Luther Friedman. I don't know. Um, shout out to Conor McGregor fans. His friend passed away yesterday in her 50s, a week from her wedding. Are you trying to fucking jinx me? I'm just trying to you know, put a smile on your face. That's awful, man. That's awful. That's why, like I say, seriously, you know, tomorrow is never guaranteed. I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer to close out the show, but tomorrow is not guaranteed. So I'd rather just have fun and enjoy myself, you know, and the people, you know, out there that don't like it, there's nothing I could do to change their minds. I wish things would be different in a lot of ways, but there's nothing I could do. So, you know, do I be a dick or do we just have fun? Ah, uh, all right. So let's continue this conversation tomorrow. I'll be back tomorrow at 8.05 p.m. for the sit-down. Now, tomorrow, even though this sheet has a whole bunch of topics on it, tomorrow it'll be blank. And uh, you will fill in that sheet. You will bring up the topics. You will ask the questions. I will be here for the answers. Now, yeah, we're doing a mailbag next Thursday. I posted a link. I posted a thread in the community section. Posted two, actually. One for channel members, one for everyone else. I hate to say it like that, but that's what it is. So if you got a question that you want me to cover on next Thursday's show, that'll be pre-recorded. So I'm going to record it Wednesday afternoon, but it'll premiere next Thursday night. Um, I'll do it at a time that doesn't, you know, conflict with, like, uh, Wrestling Soup or Kev, Kev's show. Because I know some of you tune into those shows. Uh, I might premiere it at, like, five o'clock in the afternoon. I don't know. So maybe international friends could enjoy it at a reasonable time and it'll be online. So you don't have to be here live. If I do premiere it, I'll hang out in the chat room. So even though it's already pre-recorded, I'll probably hang out in the chat room if anybody wants to hang around. So, but, um, I'll be back here tomorrow, eight or 5 PM. Join me. We'll have a fun show. We'll talk about whatever is on your mind. We'll see what transpires in news over the next 24 hours and think about, what, I, what we said tonight, you know, about the Benoit stuff, about AEW, WWE, Vince, you know, should we criticize the woman who, you know, claimed this terrible behavior by Vince in 2005, but 13 years later demands a payday? Is that blackmail? Kind of feels like blackmail to me. I don't think Vince just sent a surprise Christmas card 13 years later and like, you know, like, hey, I'm really sorry. Here's seven and a half million reasons for, uh, you know, I ask you to please keep it quiet. So, but again, this is how this stuff is being uncovered it's from the investigation. So be well, everybody. Much love. I'll see you tomorrow night, 8.05 p.m. Blue Wire Pro Wrestling TV. Make it happen, everybody. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a podcaster. For me to live any other way was nuts. To me, those goody-good people who work shitty jobs for bum paychecks and took the subway to work every day and worried about their bills were dead. I mean, they were suckers. They had no balls. If I wanted something, I just took it. I ran everything. I paid the bills. I paid the host. I even paid the masked maniac. Everybody had their hands out. Everything was for the taking. We always called each other good fellas. You would always hear from somebody. You're gonna like Don Tony. He's all right, he's a good fella. He's one of us. But if you're part of my crew, nobody ever tells you they're gonna get rid of you. It doesn't happen that way. 
There weren't any arguments or curses like in the movies. See, your haters come with smiles. They come as your friends, the people who've claimed they care the most for your life. And now, now that's all over. And that's the best part. Today everything is different. There's lots of action. I don't have to wait around for everything like everyone else. Oh, I didn't get the vaccine? Fuck you, vaccine me. Oh, your delivery guy has COVID? Fuck you, feed me. Right after I moved here, I ordered egg noodles and ketchup. And I got spaghetti with meat sauce. I'm no longer an average nobody. While they get to live the rest of their lives like a bunch of schnooks.